All right, what is this? What's this arrangement? Mr. Drysdale. CSI KFC? Okay, so we're all on the same page. I'm going to ask you a couple of get to know you questions when it comes to murder mysteries and um, crime thrillers and that sort of thing. Sure. So, <clears throat> Murder She Wrote or Diagnosis Murder or Columbo? Well, I mean, Columbo, I think, is all time classic, great murder mystery stuff. If I found my partner dead, I'd never think of opening my letters. But I. I... I just did it to distract myself, I mean. Although it's very different. Columbo, you know, the whole shtick is they reveal the murderer in the first five minutes, and then it's how is Columbo going to catch them. Although not entirely. They usually reveal the murderer, but not entirely how they did it. And yeah. Columbo has to put a few things together. So I think that Columbo wins for me. Are you aware that in Budapest there's a Columbo statue? No, really? Why in Budapest? I have no idea. That's amazing. If you ever go there, it's brass, it's gorgeous, even his dog's there. Yeah, I guess I have to I have to move to Budapest, I guess. Next yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Miss Marple or Poirot or Peter Whimsey or Father Brown? I mean, they're all so, so different. They're all charming in their own way. I mean, I guess I um, Poirot for me, because, mostly because of Peter Ustinov's portrayal of him. I think I've scared him off for the moment, but who knows what he'll try next. Or oh, any of them, for that matter. He's my favorite Poirot. Mm -hmm. And I find that character endlessly amusing, mostly because I have Ustinov's version in my head. But all four of those are just, I mean, you can't go wrong you with just can't. any of them, yeah. Miss Cabrera, um, we kept you waiting all afternoon because I wanted to hear from you last. I needed an entire picture of the evening in my head, and your piece of it is at its very center. As a film critic, I sometimes get asked, what's your favorite genre? Yeah. And for the longest time, I try to bat away the question, and then I said courtroom dramas, because it was kind of an interesting... I love a good courtroom drama. Yeah. You know, kind of answer. And then yeah. I went, well, honestly, it is a murder mystery, because yeah. they're... There's always more to them every time you watch them, and they're just yeah. kind of this kind of puzzle box thing that really appeals to me. Yeah. And I've talked a lot about my favorite ones, Stop me if these connect with you, but yeah. the Thin Man series, sure. obviously Clue, and maybe the best known film of all time, besides Knives Out, Murder by Death. Oh my God, Murder by Death, yeah. I have taken the liberty of putting you in the same wing as Mr. Wang. Oh, isn't that nice, darling? We're in Wang's wing. <laughs> Just extraordinary. So good. What would you add to that list of, if you haven't tried a murder mystery, you've got to check it out? Well, I mean, again, I'm a big fan of the Christie adaptations that were the all-star casts. So Death on the Nile and Evil Under the Sun, they kind of hit the sweet spot for me. The Last of Sheila is one that I recommend. Have you seen that one? I have not. Oh, my goodness. Put it at the top of your list. Three hours to magic time. Bye-bye. Last of Sheila, it's a 1970s movie with an incredible 1970s cast. It's like James Coburn, Heidi, Heidi, old Diane Cannon, and Richard Benjamin. It was written by Stephen Sondheim and Anthony Perkins. And Sondheim was a big mystery nut. He was a mystery fiend. He, uh, he would throw these elaborate murder mystery parties for all his rich friends. And this is a movie that he wrote about a rich author who throws the, this elaborate murder mystery party for all his friends. And of course, is somebody there? a real murder happens and it all goes wrong. What's going on? Hey, that's not fair. The Last of Sheila. Highly recommended. I'm giddy to leave this interview. Oh, you're gonna love it, yeah, yeah. We just wanna ask a few questions. We understand the night of his demise, the family had gathered to celebrate your father's 85th birthday. How was it, by the way? The party, pre my dad's death. Oh, it was great. All right, let's get into the writing of this because if I were you, and I'm not, but if I were you and I was writing this, I would either have a plan for every single beat or I'd want to go down the rabbit hole myself yeah. and see where you found the story going. Where were you? 
Well, I I mean, the way I wrote the same way I write usually, which is very structurally. So mm-hmm. I need to know the whole plan. So I start very, very vague in terms of the shape of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And then I slowly work out the details step by step. So for me, it, I start not even thinking, okay, who, who did it and how? I even think broader than that. Like, what's the shape of the whole story? How does it, okay, so maybe this starts to happen, we think it's this, and then it shapes because that will lead into this, and then I start filling in the specifics. I'm tantalized by the characters that you've created in this film because they're so rich, I want to know much more about them, which mm. which feels like a real... That's a good thing. You know, right? Yeah. In mentioning these other stories that Christopher Plummer's character has written, yeah. is there a temptation for you to write... Death by surprise. Yeah, <laughs> deadly by surprise. That's it. We did think about like getting into. I did briefly think about like getting in touch with Danica McKellar and doing like a deadly by surprise promo, which would, I think would be really fun. My wife and I are both very big fans of uh, of both Hallmark movies mm-hmm. and uh, the, the the mysteries that they do and their Christmas movies. Uh, and uh, so I don't know. That would have been quite fun, but we didn't end up doing it. <laughs> These things happen. Yeah. Your cast is exceptional. I'm sure everyone who walks into the room has been saying so. Yeah. When you got Daniel Craig on, though... Who is that guy? Was that the moment that things unlocked, or was it just... I mean, how did the casting process happen? Yeah, it was Daniel Craig signing up. He was the first one to sign up. He was the first piece of the puzzle. And also, when you have Daniel Craig starring in your movie, suddenly you have a movie, and it means you're (laughs) making a movie. And... uh, so, but he also he had a brief window before he started shooting his James Bond movie. Where so we also had to get our film together very quickly to hit that window. Sure, um, which was great. We could just go out to actors and say, okay, do you want to show up in Boston in six weeks and and have do this fun thing with us? And I think that helps. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request that you all stay until the investigation is completed. What were the unique challenges to shooting a murder mystery film, particularly under a time scale? Because I'm imagining every film has its unique challenges, of course, but yeah. with a murder mystery, you've got the editing factor and there's the tone. You don't know what the music is quite yet, I'm imagining, which yeah. all come together to create the package. What were those unique challenges that you discovered in the process? Well, the tone was a big thing with this. I mean, you mentioned Clue and Murder by Death, which I love both of those. But um, I think those are reference points. People have a lot for mysteries, and those mm-hmm. are really parodies. Wadsworth, am I right in thinking there is nobody else in this house? Mm-hmm. No. Then there is someone else in this house. No, sorry. I said no meaning yes. No meaning yes? So those yes. are kind of movies sending up uh, the murder mystery. Whereas yeah. I, with this, I, I wanted to draw, draw a clear line that this was going to be fun and this was going to be funny, but it is a straightforward attempt at the genre. It's, it's different in that regard from those films. So drawing that line in terms of tone and saying no matter how big and how fun we go, we're always going to have one foot on the ground. There are going to be real stakes. You have to actually care about like the main characters. I suspect foul play. I have eliminated no suspects. That was kind of something important from the start. Uh, and then, yeah, just sort of keeping track of, because one of the fun things about who done it is it operates on two timelines. There's mm-hmm. the present day investigation and then there's the night of the killing. And so you're constantly dipping from one timeline down into the other keeping track of what insert shots you're filming for which flashbacks when that can be a bit of math, you know. And again, without getting too lost in the weeds, you've got those two timelines, but the lower timeline of what happened on the night yeah. has several twists of unreliable narrators. Absolutely. So you're seeing, and that's what's really fun to play with, seeing the same moment play several different ways depending on who's telling it, sometimes in very subtle differences and different subtle ways. I mean, that's all... That's the candy. That's like what's fun about these type of movies. I don't want to give too much away, but you do create, at least to my mind, the first unreliable, reliable narrator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is uh, 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 genius. Uh, In terms of the writing process, just to go back to that, when did that come to you? Well, I mean, and again, we're kind of talking around it, so, so not to spoil anything, but um, I mean, for me, I. It was really important because I love a good whodunit, but I also feel like the best of them are also very good movies. Like you can't rely – the whole thing can't just be an exercise in can you guess it or not. Yes. There needs to be some some other layers of satisfaction to the story. 
Um, and I, that's why there's sort of more of a Hitchcock thriller engine built into the middle of the movie. It's almost like a rope. The, uh, a bit, yeah, yeah, sort of. It's more Hitchcocky in terms of, um, yeah, or like The Wrong Man or something. Okay. It's something where, or the 39 Steps. It's sort of, it's something mm-hmm. where we have a character is put into peril that you care about, and are they going to be able to get out of it, as yes. opposed to just assembling clues and can you put together the puzzle before the detective does. Um, so there was kind of that, and I I wanted it to have an emotional through line. I wanted there to be this character that you were concerned about and cared about. That kind of led the way in terms of whose perspective we see everything through. Um, it gave kind of a guiding light in terms of where we were aiming for. To jump away from the kind of more cerebral aspects of the movie, the production design is oh, nice, huh? yeah. astonishing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I need more like, kind of pauses in that word. Astonishing. <laughs> like the decisions you make, I'm presuming, and that your production designer came up with. Yeah. The knife. Yeah. I want to say circle. Let's yeah. call it that. Yeah. Certain statues and models and whatever. Yeah. How much of an absolute joy was it for you to oversee that? I mean, it was such a pleasure. The the knife. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to call it. the knife halo. I guess you, uh, you could the say knife donut. donut. The knife donut. That was that was something that was written into the script. I didn't know exactly what it would look like, but I know I wanted almost like a religious icon made of knives, yep. all pointing in towards the center. And uh, yeah, David Crank, who was my production designer, who's an amazing, amazing designer. Yeah, his team, they found at the very last minute a big industrial barbecue grate that was circular, (laughs) and they mounted all the knives on it. But, I mean, the big reference I gave David was um, another one of my favorite movies, the 1970s version of Sleuth, Michael Caine and Laurence Olivier, which is another movie that takes place in a big mansion Mm -hmm. that is owned by a murder mystery writer, and the inside of the mansion is like the inside of his brain. Yep. A creeping, hairdressing seducer of silly women. A jumped-up pantry boy who doesn't know his place! So I gave them that reference and said, just go to town, and they did, man. It's so rich, the amount of detail in that house. It's so much fun to watch. Look around. I mean, the guy practically lives in a clue board. I've got to ask what made it home with you, because I know as director, people presume you have absolute power, but you can't take everything Uh, home. What did make it back I to? I really what wanted to take the knife halo. But here's the problem. Half of those knives rented. We had to return the knives. <laughs> so often the way. Oh, the knives could not come. Yeah, the knives <laughs> had to come out at the end of the day. I can't give you enough compliments about this movie. Oh, it's kind of I do feel like it was made for me. And I've got a thousand <laughs> different questions to ask about yeah. cow and shotgun and keep calm and Bergeron. And <laughs> the continuity nightmare of having such a long yeah. cigar for Daniel Craig. Oh, my goodness. Whether he wears his own socks. <laughs> Congratulations again. Uh, thank you so much. I'm um, so happy you And if you it. ever yeah. do a Knives Out 2 somehow, I am there with bells on. All right, well, get out the bells, man. I will. <laughs> try it, yeah. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to keep up to date. You can listen to my Radio 1 movies and TV podcast screen time on BBC Sounds. And you can find these interviews in full on BBC iPlayer by searching Movies with Ali Plum.